Anne Pfeiffer is here from the University of Minnesota to talk about growing healthy soil. So I'll let you take awesome. it away. Thanks. Yeah. Um, perfect. Great. So I'm going to chat about soil, um, and we're going to do a couple different things today. I'm going to start uh, the first half of the class or so talking just generally about what soil is, um, and a, like a little bit about why we care and how we tell what kind of soil we have and how that might affect what kind of farming and management decisions we make. And then the second half of the class is going to be focused on cover cropping and how you can use cover crops to improve your soil quality. Um, can I have a quick, how many people are familiar with the idea of cover cropping? How many people have grown cover crops before? Try it. Perfect. Okay, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, so I'm going to jump right into just the sort of basic soil science. Stop me anytime you have questions. Um, I've chatted a little bit with Laura about your background, so I tried to make this uh, hopefully an appropriate level for most of you, but really happy to stop and back up if there's anything you're confused about or get into a little bit more detail um, if you have more in-depth questions. So um, I really want this to be interactive um, and helpful to you. So, um, and I'm gonna probably walk around a little bit, Laura. I hope that's okay with your filming. It's fine, yeah. Um, so this is our overview of where we're gonna go tonight. Uh, we're gonna start by talking about soil type. How does that impact your management, how you farm. Um, and I'm gonna use those two words a lot probably tonight, management and practices. And by that I just mean what you're doing, how you're choosing to till, when you're tilling, what kind of equipment you're using, um, how you can improve your soil structure. We'll probably take a break in between and then get into cover cropping, what cover cropping is and how you can use it on your farm and in your uh, plant specifically. All right, so I want to start with a little discussion about what soil is. Um, a lot of folks uh, who are not in the farming world just think of it as dirt. Uh, we all know that it's way more than that and a lot more important. Um, obviously, it holds up our plants. A lot of farmers are really only concerned about that and they're adding whatever chemicals they think their plants need. Um, and the soil is really there just to hold the roots. I work in organic farming, and so for me, soil is a lot more important because I'm really relying on the soil to provide a lot of the nutrients um, and hold on to the water because I want to take advantage of what's already in the soil rather than having to just add other uh, chemical amendments to my farm. Uh, air and water actually come much more from the soil than they do from the atmosphere around the plant. Um, certainly, soil can supply nutrients if we have a really rich, healthy soil. Um, and really importantly, it provides habitat for microorganisms. And we'll talk a little bit more about all the other stuff that's living in your soil um, and why that's important. So I want to take a minute just to talk about good soil. What do you all think of uh, when you have, when you say I have a really good soil or a bad soil? How would you decide that? <coughs> Moist, dark. Moist, dark. We will answer that question for you tonight. Sure. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. We'll talk about that specifically a little bit. Lots of things in there eating away, crunching. Yeah. Worms. Worms. Yep. Awesome. <coughs> So you hit on a lot of the things that I use. So if I'm looking at an ideal farm soil, and remember this is for farming, right? If we were building a tall building, we would be describing good soil in different ways. In that case, we want one that's just gonna be really stable or maybe drain well. For farming, we want one that's fertile, has a lot of inherent nutrients in it, uh, certainly deep, and by deep we mean like, uh, you know, if you've been someplace, like the North Shore, it's really rocky, right? You're gonna hit, rock, you know, maybe just an inch or two below the surface. That's not going to be very good for farming. Um, in this part of the state, we're lucky mostly to have really deep soils, so we know we can till them. Our plant roots are going to have a lot of soil that they can uh, go deep down into. We want it to be well drained and aerated, uh, so that kind of nice fluffy soil that the plant roots can get through really easily. 
Uh, we want it to be high in organic matter, um, and that's where we're getting a lot of those nutrients that we hope the soil is providing for our plants, and friable, and that just means easily worked, and that gets to your loam point, uh, that we want it to be not really like clay, soggy, hard, but we also don't want it to be beach sand, uh, because we know that our plants wouldn't grow well in that either. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Ask more questions, though, if I don't quite get to what you're hoping for. So we're going to start at the very beginning. Soil is actually only about half solid stuff, and then it's half water and air. Um, and then this little slice here is organic matter. Um, and by organic matter in this context, we basically mean dead things. So all of those microbes or old bits of plant root um, or other things that were once living and are now dead. And some of those are recently dead, like in the last year or two. Some of them maybe died hundreds of years ago and just haven't quite broken down all the way. Um, and so that's the reason that if you are farming organically, you might have a slower release of nutrients. So if you took a powdered chemical uh, nitrogen fertilizer, it's all going to dissolve pretty quickly in your soil. If you put on organic fertilizer, it's usually going to dissolve much uh, more slowly, and so your plants might only get a portion of that the first year, and then you might get a portion the second year. And that's because it's, uh, those living bits can dissolve at different rates. What is considered organic fertilizer? Um, something coming from a natural source. So, um, bone meal? Yeah. Um, for the purposes of organic certification, uh, there are lists that you can look up exactly what is certified organic because the company has to go through a paperwork process basically. Um, but you should be able to see a logo on the product that's usually it's OMRI, O-M-R-I, um, is the National Certifying Board. So if you want to be sure that it's going to uh, be acceptable in organically certified practices, look for that O-M-R-I label. Um, some other things are allowed and then you can talk to your specific certifier, like if you had a local compost source or something like that. Yeah? I'm just going to clarify too that just because it's OMRI approved, you still have to check with your certifier to make sure that your certifier approves it. It's kind of specific to each certifier, but starting with the OMRI logo is a good thing. Great, thanks. And yeah. we will also talk more about that on Saturday's class. Um, and for people that can't make Saturday's class, I'll make sure to upload the PowerPoint. So, Super. Yeah, Thanks, Laura. That on so if I go to Home Depot and I say, the pack works, it's like organic, and I just want to buy it, I can't use it. Well, like Laura said, each certifier has slightly different rules. Um, there's a you know, there's a big list of things in the middle that pretty much every single organic certifier is going to say, yes, this is fine. Um, there are some things that are a little bit, you know, more unusual, and maybe those are where you're going to run into questions. So most certifiers are pretty happy to work particularly with new growers to help make sure that they have that information. And I imagine that Laura can help mediate that conversation to answer any questions that you have. But. Um, if in doubt, check with your certifier. I work in a uh, I have a very good of company farm, and I went to Home Depot, and I bought a fertilizer instead of organic. Actually, it's on the one way to remove the whole thing from the To whom the water to remove the fertilizer from the top side. Because she said, ah, it is not certified just because it's organic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to start by talking about the solid part. So this, you know, about 50% here. So the solid part is mostly broken down rock pieces, you know, little tiny bits of rock. And so the type of soil you have really depends on ancient geology. So whatever rocks were here, like when the earth formed, is going to play the biggest role in what kind of soil you have. So there's, we're going to talk later in the class tonight about what we can do to improve our soil, but the biggest piece of it is something that you can't change. So that's why it's really important when you're looking at land 
to understand how you tell what kind of soil that is. Um, you're going to be able to do a little bit, you know, if you have a really worn out cornfield that somebody's just been, you know, taking poor care of for 50 years, you can do a little bit with that. But if you have soil that's just not appropriate for agriculture because it's too sandy or too clay, there's not a lot you can do to change that. Um, this organic matter is the part we're going to talk more about later in the class that you can change. So making decisions like adding cover crops or like having good crop rotation is going to be the biggest part of what you can do to improve your soil. Um, the other really important piece is the not solid part of your soil. So that's about 25% um, air and 25% water. Obviously, after a really big rainstorm, it's going to be a lot more water and less air. If it's really dry and hot in the middle of the summer, it might be more air and less water. Um, so this is what I was talking about a second ago. Soil texture is the percentage of the different sized particles that your soil has. So it's, we call them sand, silt, and clay. And in this context of soil science, Sand, silt, and clay are really only about particle size. Um, we're, at this point, we're not talking about what kind of rock or material it is. Um, and really, this is going to determine how water and air move through your soil as well as plant roots. So this is my very uh, basic example for you all. But if you have a really fine soil, so a lot of clay particles, and they're all bunched together in your soil versus if you had a soil that's really sandy with bigger particles. You can all imagine how the water is going to move much more slowly through this than it is through this with these really giant pore sizes. But at the same time, a plant's roots are going to have a harder time getting through all these little tiny spaces than these big spaces. Does that make sense? So, you know, this is just a sort of a silly example, but it gives you a nice visual for how you want, you know, a little bit of the big and a little bit of the little so that you have that balance. Can you talk about the particle size? Like, is the sand the biggest, the soil is next to the place? Yes. You are anticipating all of my next slides. Perfect. Okay. So this gets to your question that you asked earlier about loam. So, this is called the soil triangle. I don't want to spend a lot of time tonight on learning how to use it because it can get a little confusing unless you work with it. But this is how we actually define different soil types. So if you hear somebody say, I have a loamy soil, technically what they're saying is that they have about 45% sand. Um, actually, let's skip ahead for a second and come back to this. Okay, so getting to your question about the different particle size. Sand is the biggest. Sand is technically defined as uh, 0.2 micromillimeters to 2 micromillimeters. You can tell, you've all been to the beach, you know what sand feels like, right? It feels hard and gritty between your fingers. Um, and you can imagine, you all intuitively know this already. If you pour water through sand, it's going to go through really quickly. You know that it's going to warm up and dry out more quickly in the spring because there's nothing to hold that water in there. Um, it's also low in organic matter, right? When you see sand, it doesn't have that dark, um, you know, pieces of what we think of as soil. Um, and by association, it's low in nutrients because we find the nutrients in that organic matter. So the next, the middle size is called silt. Silt is uh, 0 0.002 to 0 0.5 micromillimeters. It's about as thick as a strand of hair. Uh, you can find silt if you feel it dry between your fingers. It feels like a ground flour, like wheat flour. Um, and if it's wet, it feels a little bit sticky. Clay is, feels sticky when it's wet and when it's dry. Uh, so the flour feel is what you can, how you can tell silt. Um, and silt is kind of the sweet spot. It's, not too big, not too little, sort of the Goldilocks of our soil. Can you explain a little bit what silt is? All it is for this discussion is particles of this size. So sand, silt, and clay all can be any material. They're just defined by size. Different materials tend to break down more or less. So we tend to find like quartz heavy 
soils are more sandy, whereas um, kaolin heavy soils are more clay. But really, sand, silt, and clay is only particle size. And it could be you know, pieces that are broken down from any material. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So sand, salt, and clay in soil science are purely just size fractions. Just big, medium, and little. So then clay is the smallest piece. It has really small gaps. Um, because of that, roots can sometimes have a hard time getting through it. Again, this is probably something that you all intuitively know. If you have a really clay soil, your roots are gonna get stuck and not be able to go down quite as deep. Um, it feels sticky when it's wet. It doesn't drain easily, so it's a little bit harder to work. It can be really easy to compact or take a longer time to dry out in the springtime. Um, the thing that we like about clay is that it's usually really high in nutrients because those little tiny particles hold on to nutrients really well. So what we're hoping for in a good soil is a balance between all these different particle sizes so that we have the clay that holds the nutrients, we have the silt that kind of is the medium sized filler, and we have the clay that does let some good drainage go down. So I'm gonna back up for a second and look at this soil triangle again. So this just defines different names of soil types by the percentage of these three different sand, silt, and clay. So we look at um, a percentage here, and then we follow the line up. So if we had a soil that was a perfect loam, it would be 40% sand, 20% uh, clay, and 40% silt. So a little bit of each. That's why I said we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this because it can be confusing. Um, if we had a soil, so we're following these triangles here. Um, if you can see that clay is a really big part of this triangle um, and that all of this, when we talk about having a good agricultural soil, we're usually talking about this loam, silt loam kind of area. So all of this area are the soils that are giving us a little bit of all three types of particle size. That's really as deep as I want to go into it tonight. If anybody wants to chat more about this afterwards, I'm really happy to do that. Um, but I don't want to get too deep into this right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? What's the difference between loamy sand and sandy loam? It's kind of like partly sunny versus partly cloudy. Um, so a sandy loam has more sand. What was a loamy sand and sandy loam? So, um, so loamy sand is like a sand, really. I mean, at this point, we're 80, 90 percent sand. So it's essentially sand with a little bit of loam is soil, whereas this is a loam that has a high amount of sand in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of. I guess if you think of it like this one, if you think, of, ah, I can't get my arm here. Sand. That's really a sand, and this is really a loam, but they're, you know, heavily tilted toward that other side. Can you just see what the ratios of the ideal soil is? 40% of sand? Anything in this area, you know, really, it's just that you want to stay kind of in the middle of this triangle. For farming, you don't want something that's at any one of the extremes. Yeah, Laura? For, like, practicality purposes, if you're just trying and you're like on the farm and you're like, I want to see if this is good soil. Do you have any tricks that people can use to be like, this is good, like if you like, like I know like May will like grab a clump of soil and like throw it up in a ball and if it like crumbles perfectly on her hand, then she knows that it's like good and moisture level and stuff. Yeah. Do you have, any, do you have anything like that or not? I don't have anything like that. Um, and you know, people, part of it is knowing what kind of soil you have just so that you can make good decisions with it. Um, I know really successful farms that are on all kinds of soil that you probably wouldn't look at and say like, wow, this is great soil. Um, but different things grow well in different soils. So if you do find yourself in a situation that you have really sandy soil, then it might make sense to look at crops that grow well in hot, dry conditions because you know that you're going to have 
more hot dry weather than a neighbor. So I know a farmer who grows like eight acres of just basil on pretty much beach sand and has a great livelihood. Um, you know, if you have a really silty soil, probably you might want to consider growing root crops because they're going to be able to, you know, just do really nicely, have nice drainage. So part of it is figuring out what kind of soil you have and then matching that with the kind of crops you're growing and also just being aware so that you know if you have a really clay soil, you need to be super cautious about not going in there in the spring and tilling it when it's wet because you will just destroy any soil aggregation you have. So a lot of it is just about knowing what you have and learning how to work with that. Hi. All right. Yes, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. All right, so we talked about this a little already. Most soils are a mixture of sand, silt, and clay. It's very rare that you're gonna find one that is all one thing. Um, and what we know about the soil type can help us figure out how we wanna manage it. So a sandy soil is gonna drain really quickly. A clay soil is gonna drain really slowly but have really high nutrient content. Um, they can all be good or bad. We just need to learn how to work with the particular soil that we have. All right, this is what I was talking about. Um, I mentioned something about aggregation. So these are some sketches of different kinds of soil particle sizes. So something like this single grain might be a really sandy soil that doesn't have much organic matter. Um, this platy structure is something that you're more likely to see in clay, like that poker chip analogy, that you just have all these sticky cells that are right on top of each other, so it's really hard for the water to get through that. Um, what you generally want in a good soil is something kind of between this blocky and granular structure. So you want that, those pieces of organic matter that are holding together clumps of soil. I want to, if the internet's working, I'm going to stop and show you a little video quick. 40 years. It is covered with diverse plants year round. Watch what happens when we drop the soil in the water. Notice how the conventional till soil is falling apart. The biotic blooms in the organic matter are burned up by killers. The soil pores have collapsed. Notice the no-till soil. The pore spaces are still intact. Do this test for yourself. So this My soil family. has been tilled a lot, and this soil has not been tilled at all. Um, so the idea that we're seeing there is that the um, So the idea we're seeing is that when we have a soil that we're building organic matter and we're letting those roots go down into over time, all of those roots and microbes and organic things that break down hold the, the soil together in clumps. So if you pick up a soil, you'll see, you don't see grains of sand, you see little clumps of soil. Um, and those <coughs> clumps are really important because they're holding spaces that water and air and roots can move through. Um, if we work our soil too much and we overtill it and we don't add organic matter, then we lose all of that organic matter glue. And so then we're going to see that soil that just dispersed in the water. So you can imagine then that after a big rainstorm, all of those little particles are just going to fall apart and then you get soil that's really compacted. So then over time, rain can't get through there, you're going to start seeing drainage issues. Uh, you're going to have really wet fields, uh, whereas if you have really good organic matter, then that water can move down, you're not going to have as much flooding, um, and your plants are going to be able to do better because they aren't going to be in this either drought or flood situation. Does that make sense? What's that? Yeah, so all of anything that's living in the soil that dies, like plant roots or microbes or you know any living things, when they die, the process of their bodies or plant structures breaking down is essentially what holds the soil together. Um, 
there's a lot of different chemistry and different things happening there that we're not going to get into tonight. Um, but just generally knowing that that broken down material is what's helping keep those clumps in your soil. All right, so that stuff we're talking about is this little tiny slice of the pie right here. Um, but that's really what we as farmers can manage and what we can do to change our soil. And it makes a really big difference. All right, so now we're gonna move a little bit from this sort of basic soil structure into soil health and why we care about that. So this is all stuff that you all know in your head, even if you don't define it this way. So I wanna stop and spend a couple minutes talking about what is healthy soil? What do you all see in your soil that helps your crops grow well? Organic matter. Organic matter. Weeds, old roots, insects. Yep. Other things that you would know or think you would see a soil and be like, wow, this looks like good soil. See work from living there. Yep, so anything living is a good sign. Anything you do on your farm that you think helps the soil? Um, fertilizer. Fertilizer. Great. Add compost. Compost. Yeah. For sure. <coughs> um, and that's an important distinction that we make. So fertilizer is certainly a tool that we use a lot in farming. Um, if we're just using chemical fertilizer, we don't get any of that organic matter. So although it's providing nutrients to the plants, it's not really doing much to help the soil over the long term. If we add compost, then that's adding nutrients along with some organic matter structure. So we're getting a lot more that's gonna stay in our soil long term. Um, and it's gonna be able to help hold water in the future, help hold nutrients in the future. Um, so not that we should use all of one or all of the other, but just understanding that they're different in that way in adding organic matter to the soil. So I'm gonna talk, just go through a couple slides pretty quickly about the stuff that's in soil that we care about. Uh, microorganisms, we've been talking about a little bit, all these little tiny worms, bugs, microscopic things. Um, having a diverse soil food web is important because it's these critters that actually break down those old leaves and sticks and dead bodies of other uh, old bugs. And it's the breakdown of that nutrients that actually releases food for our plants. So when these bugs eat other dead stuff, that's how our plants get nitrogen. So we want as much of this living uh, biota in our soil as we can. Um, next, reducing erosion. So we saw the slake test and thought a little bit about how that soil stays together better if we have organic matter. If I can get it to work, I want to show you one other video about erosion. In North Carolina, in the summertime, when we're getting... So let me stop and explain this real quick. So has anybody seen this from NRCS? You? It's, it's cool in person, isn't it? Um, so the Natural Resource Conservation Service is a, a federal office that has offices in most states. Um, you may meet them at places like the um, Beginning Farmers Conference. Probably they were at Moses. They'll be at the Minnesota Organic Conference. So if you ever see them at a conference like that, they offer a lot of different uh, conservation-minded programs. Uh, they're the ones who have the uh, match funding to build high tunnels through the EQUIP program. Um, but they do a lot of education about maintaining our soil and being good stewards. So this is something, this one is from North Carolina, so that's why the soil is this really red color. But uh, they have one in Minnesota. They'll show up sometimes at different events. And what you're seeing here is different covers. So this is bare soil right here. Uh, these are a couple of different, I think this is a cover crop, this is a grass cover crop, this is just a surface mulch of straw, and I think this is just like lawn turf grass. So watch how the soil erosion happens into these jars with the rainstorm. Rain, 90% of the time, it's water. It's a storm. We get a storm. 
It's tricky, um, and there, I mean, in vegetable farming especially, these are choices that we make. So nobody is gonna tell you that you just shouldn't grow your beans like that. And if you're growing a cover crop among all of your vegetables, probably it's gonna compete too much and it's not gonna get you a good cash crop. So it's not so much about never having bare soil as taking measures when you can to do something. So maybe making sure that you are planting along the contours of any uh, hill that you have. So if you have a hill that goes like this, planting this way rather than down the hill. Um, because then when you have rain, it's gonna get caught at each row of your vegetables rather than just running straight down the paths. Um, or when you take those beans out, if you have time at the end of the season, put in a cover crop. It doesn't need to be there all summer long, um, but when you have times, and we'll get into talking about cover crop windows in a little bit, but really it's about keeping your soil covered when you can and being mindful that this is what's happening when it's not covered. Um, not about avoiding it all the time, but just understanding what that process looks like. So we talked about soil aggregation, how having that organic matter and that clumpy soil is really helpful. Um, stronger plants. So my analogy here is when you, you know that if you're stressed out, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, taking good care of yourself, you are more likely to get sick, right? If you feel a cold coming on, you think, oh, I need to take it easy for a couple days, but better early. Plants are the same way. If they're growing in not very good soil and they don't have the nutrients or water they need, they're more likely to get sick or be susceptible to insects. So a lot of people see that if you have really healthy soil and healthy plants, 
you might actually have a little bit of inherent resistance against some pests and diseases. Water filtration, we talked about a little bit already with the NRCS video. Um, and really the takeaway here is that you have more productive crops. If they can grow well in good soil with good water, your plants are gonna do better. Um, so while it's good to take care of your soil from an environmental perspective so that you don't have runoff going into streams, it really comes back to your farm being a productive, profitable business as well. All right, I think I wanna take a little break here um, and then we're gonna jump into cover crops. I forgot I brought a couple of soils for you all to look at. So I'm gonna pass these around. Um, so these three soils are all from Wisconsin. Um, but they're really nice examples. So this first one is called a muck soil, and this one is really, really high in organic matter. Um, like higher than you would, it is a naturally occurring soil, but um, it's not something that you see typically. This is pretty close to Milwaukee, and this kind of soil is actually really great for growing carrots and celery. Um, this uh, historically was one of the biggest carrot producing areas of the country until California intentionally put them out of business. Um, this second one is a silk loam. So it's really dry right now, so it doesn't quite look like a, uh, like a typically would in the field, but if you feel it, you can kind of feel that it's kind of in the middle. It's not uh, really fine, but it's also not really sandy. So this would be that sort of middle of the road, a little bit of everything kind of soil that we're going for. And then this last one is almost all sand. It's uh, um, sandy loam. So this is not quite all the way to that sand corner, but pretty close. This is from, has anybody ever heard of the Central Sands area of Wisconsin? We actually have some of it in Minnesota too, but this is potato growing country. So you can imagine that a root crop would do really well in this really sandy, loose soil. Um, the disadvantage of this soil is that it holds almost no water. So farms on this kind of sand pretty much have to be irrigated because you just need water every day um, artificially because the soil can't hold uh, pretty much anything. All right, so let's chat about how we're gonna improve our soil health. So the first thing that we talk about is crop rotation. Uh, so we all know that it's important to rotate our crops for disease and pest purposes, um, but it also allows us to add different things to our soil. So different kinds of roots, uh, root crops like carrots can break up a soil really nicely, whereas things uh, with a bigger, more fibrous root system can add more organic matter. So rotating all those different things essentially allows us to balance things out. Uh, the second thing we want to do is minimize tillage. So we talked about how we really want to see that soil aggregation, all those clumps, so that we have big pore space for water and roots. Every time we till, um, and especially with a bigger piece of equipment that's uh, breaking the soil down more, we're compacting all those little pore spaces that we've been working so hard to build. Yeah. Sure. Why do we till? Anybody have a thought about that? Yeah, I would say how you need to rest your bed and when you tell either how you need either to rest your bed. Um, or sometimes you need to destroy um, some cover crops and you need to uh, put that underneath. It helps to break down the old plants and cover crops. Um, tillage can be especially important if we're direct seeding something um, because we need to make sure that we have really good seed to soil contact. So if we're putting in transplants, it's not quite as important to have really good tillage, but if we're planting you know, spinach seeds straight into the soil, if we have really big chunks, it might be hard for those seeds to do well. Yeah, so this really dark one is the organic soil. It's called muck. Um, 
but you could just generally call it an organic soil. And then there's one that like pretty much feels like beach sand. And this so that is the one you know, the roots are just said that the fruit and then grow up in the potatoes? Yeah, so this is potato grown actually. Um, and it has low nutrients and really poor water holding. So they need to they need to add a lot of fertilizer and a lot of irrigation. That's good on it. They got to look like they cannot suck it yet. Because the only thing we can find it is cassava. And cassava is a root crop. Uh -huh. That is all we can find. Yeah, well, that makes sense because the root crop would move through it really easily. Is it easier to earlier about you know what if we do have erosion or bare soil I'm not asking any of you to never till at all uh, but we're trying to minimize it so thinking about can I get by with uh, driving my tractor over once instead of three times or can I plan my crops in a way that I can you know just direct seed instead of tilling at one point in the season so being it's about being mindful and making very conscious decisions about what you have to do um, in, rather than you know trying to not do it at all uh, because we know that that's not always possible adding organic matter we've talked about that a lot and we'll talk about some ways to do that uh, this picture uh, is showing adding compost. That's a great tool. Um, and adding cover crops is something else that we can do. Um, so what practices do you all do of those that we just talked about? Um, are these things that you're doing on your farm already to some degree? Cover crops and crop rotation. Cover crops, minimizing tillage, uh, thinking about the kind of equipment you're using. Crop rotation too. Rotations. No till crop rotation. No till. All right, so 
Uh, somebody asked earlier, thank you, about green manure. So these three terms here, cover crop, green manure, and catch crop, are all terms that you've maybe heard, and they all mean kind of the same thing. Um, so a green manure is something that is used to put organic matter into the soil. So just like we would use animal manure to put organic matter in the soil, a green manure is a plant that's doing the same thing. A catch crop is something that's going to take nutrients out of the soil. So one problem that we have sometimes when we're farming, we put nitrogen on in the springtime, we grow our tomatoes or whatever vegetable crop, and then sometimes at the end of the season there's actually nutrients left in the soil that our plant, our vegetable plants didn't use. And so at the end of the season, um, if we just leave it, if we take out our tomatoes and there's extra nutrients, those nutrients can flow through the soil and they'll leave your farm. They'll end up in the river, they'll end up going down the Mississippi River and being in the Gulf of Mexico. So one thing that we can do to save those nutrients is plant a catch crop. Um, something, I'll talk a little bit later about what those are, but they tend to be grasses. And so those grasses can actually pull the nutrients that are left in the soil hold on to them over the winter, and then in the springtime, when we kill those grasses, they'll let the nutrients back out into the soil, and we can use them the next spring without them flowing through into the rivers. Um, so then a cover crop is really just the general term that includes all of these things. So we talked a little bit about this already, how cover crops are different from um, other amendments, so they're different from compost in that they're living, right? So compost we just put on and one day it gives us some nutrients and some organic matter. Cover crops are different in that they're providing the same things but they're actually also covering our soil for a while. So if we have a period of time that we aren't planting something else, the cover crop is going to cover our soil so that we don't have the erosion um, in, the same, in the way that we saw that rainfall simulator. And the cover crop is also going to have roots that go down and make all those little pores in the soil. And we want those so that we're getting better water infiltration over time. Um, cover crops are also different from the chemical fertilizer because the chemical fertilizer is just adding that quick shot of nitrogen or phosphorus rather than the organic matter that goes with it. Just like Do the cover crops, if planted right, does it also uh, suffocate weeds? Yes, cover crops can definitely be used to inhibit weeds. So in non-organic systems, farms will often use an herbicide to kill their cover crops for that very reason. We can't do that in organic systems. Um, sometimes you can mow them, like with a lawnmower or a tractor-mounted flail mower, and kill them sufficiently that way. Um, sometimes you can just do a really quick light tillage and you're getting more benefit from cover crop than you are hurting your soil with tillage. Oftentimes you're gonna till your soil anyway before you plant, so you're not doing any extra tillage. Um, either way, you're getting organic matter and you're probably getting roots that are going deeper than the depth of your plow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, any time you disturb your soil, you're you're do making a trade-off, right? I mean, none of us here are going to argue that farming is not an invasive thing in our environment. Um, it's about making informed decisions um, and doing things the best way we can. All right, so cover crops do a lot of great things. We've talked about a lot of them already. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of extra fun ones. So beneficial insects. Um, particularly pollinators are your, on your farm. Some farms uh, specifically are planting cover crops that flower so that they are providing habitat for native bees. Um, and there's research happening at the university right now about whether this actually improves yield of flowering fruit and vegetable crops. 
uh, increases mycorrhizae. We've been talking about this a lot. This is all these little channels that the roots and microfungi make. Um, and this is where your air and water is traveling, making space for other roots from plants that you might want to grow. Uh, certain cover crops can inhibit pests, uh, particularly uh, harmful nematodes. Some people plant sorghum sudan grass specifically to control nematodes. They are these funny little uh, microscopic worms and essentially they can be disease vectors in your soil and they're amazingly difficult to get rid of once you have them. I, I got a question. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's related but I've, I've been told that earthworms are not the not good worms or, or um, I don't know too much about that. Um, red worms, like the kind of worms that you have in worm compost bins, are an invasive species, so those you definitely shouldn't let outside. Um, but I don't know about earthworms being good or bad. I, I, was, I don't know, it's not, it's not the class I took here last time with you guys teaching, but there was one class I took that soil wet with the lean and the yeah. She was like, you know, there's some good worms and there's some bad worms that yeah. destroy your, your organic matter and some worms that, that don't destroy. But I don't know. Yeah. Just on this pixel one. No. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't heard that, so I'm yeah. guessing it's not like a really. Yeah. I'm not sure. Sorry. <laughs> All right, we've talked about runoff and erosion. Um, I was chatting with somebody about water pooling in your field, and this is a really nice example of a field. This is the same field and one that has some cover crops growing in it between the rows and one that uh, doesn't have that. And we can really see how having those root systems allow the water to infiltrate into the field, whereas the one that doesn't have that is just getting flooded and really wet. Um, the other thing that can be really helpful in a system like this that we call this a living mulch when you have a cover crop that's actually growing in your pathway between a crop row that you're harvesting is that you can get in here in the rain um, or right after a rain. So if you have something like this planted, you've got a huge rainstorm yesterday, you want to harvest your crop today, it's no problem to walk on this. Uh, you're not going to be harming the soil because those roots are holding that pore space and you're not going to just be in a wet, muddy, sticky mess. Um, you can all imagine that trying to harvest tomatoes in this field would be really challenging. All right, so here's a couple graphics that kind of get to the same thing. So in this example, we have really compacted soil. The pore space is really compressed, so there's no place for the water to go. Um, a little bit of it gets into the soil, but there's really not enough space for it to flow down. In this example, we've planted things that we have really expanded soil structure, so we've got some nice pore space, a good percentage of air in there. Um, and then the water can flow down. So your water after rainstorm is going to be able to go through the soil profile rather than just running off the top. And this is essentially a, a cartoon graphic of that same thing we saw with the rainfall simulator, that the uh, soil with the cover crop on it is creating pathways for the water to go down through the soil rather than just running off the surface. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Here's another uh, photo of the same thing. We're seeing a really uh, wet, mucky field here. Um, water flowing in better through the cover crop. All right, and then this is what I was talking about with the scavenging nutrients, that grasses especially can be really helpful in taking those nutrients up out of the soil in the fall, holding them till the next season, and then when you mow down this grass in the spring, it's gonna let that uh, nutrient Stash back into your crop. Or spray it for the larger farm. Yeah. The grass, is that rice? Um, this is probably rye. The rye, how does the rye? Well, in this case, we wouldn't. So, one of the things that's a little bit tricky about cover crops 
Um, we generally we don't want the crops to set seed because then they're taking all of the energy out of the soil and putting all that energy into the seed. So if we're intentionally planting something to be a cover crop, we're usually going to terminate it or kill it right at the point that it's starting to produce seeds. So in rye here, uh, I call this boot stage. Um, just when you start to see that pollen falling off the flower, that's when I want to mow my rye down before it starts taking everything from the soil. Um, same thing with anything else. If I'm planting a legume like a clover or a vetch, as soon as I see about 50% of the plants flowering, that's when I want to mow it down. All right, and the last thing is adding nitrogen. Yes. Yes, so generally with a cover crop, I want to terminate it or mow it down just as it's starting to produce flowers um, because any plant is going to take the most energy out of the soil in the form of nutrients, carbohydrates, and put it into their seed. That's the plant's goal in life is to put all the nutrients into their seed. Um, so I want to stop the plant when it has grown all of the leafy vegetative matter, but before it puts all that energy into its seed, because that's the point that I'm going to be able to till it in, put the most vegetative organic matter back into my soil without the plant having concentrated all of it in the seed. So pretty much any plant as it's starting, about 50% of the field flowering. Yeah, that's a good point too. Uh, the seed can then create a weed. If you let it produce viable seed, then you're going to start having a field worth of buckwheat or rye or whatever that you have to deal with. Yeah, good points about the weed seed. Um, the research group that I work with at the university uh, specifically does a lot of work in looking at adding nitrogen. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit about that too. So any legume crop, like a pea, vetch, uh, sun hemp, anything in the legume family is going to actually pull nitrogen out of the air and add it to your soil. So you're essentially growing free nitrogen fertilizer then. So let's actually talk for just a minute about how that happens. So uh, this is my hypothetical legume cover crop growing. And in all these little pore spaces in the soil, I have nitrogen in the air um, that comes into the plant. This nitrogen um, grows up in the plant, and then when my plant dies, it breaks down into little tiny bits. And then these microbes, all those little bugs that live in my healthy soil, break down the plant matter and make it um, accessible to a corn plant. So the corn or whatever my vegetable crop is can't use this nitrogen directly from the plant. It's in the wrong form. So I need these microbes essentially to eat my bits of dead plant and poop it out in the right form for my next plant to eat. Um, so this process is really important to keep in mind that I want all of this leafy stuff to come in, I need to make sure that I have a healthy ecosystem so that I've got all these little bugs, and then they're making this nitrogen available to my next uh, crop. Is that What's up? Yes. Um, so this is ammonium and this is nitrate. So my plant makes organic nitrogen. My crop has to have inorganic nitrogen to consume. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is a study from Wisconsin, so pretty close to us. Um, and this is showing how much nitrogen credit they were getting from some different vetch cover crops. So with alfalfa, two different kinds of clover, a vetch. And this is showing if you had less than six inches of growth, you're getting about 40 pounds of nitrogen. Um, if you have more than six inches of growth and you're terminating it at that 50% flower range, uh, you're getting anywhere from 40 or 50 up to 100, 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So most uh, vegetable plants that you're growing probably have a recommendation of 100, 150 
pounds of nitrogen on the high side. So if you have a really good crop of legumes, you're growing all the nitrogen and then some that your crop could possibly want. Um, so this is money that you're saving. Uh, seed for these is relatively cheap. Um, if you can find a time to plant it in your farm, this is not only helping your soil, but it's actually growing you free fertilizer. That makes sense? How long does it take to grow up to six inches? Depends on the plant. Uh, we'll get to that. All right, and then weed control. So this is a little bit of a misleading photo. This is actually a roller crimped rye field that they've planted in. So uh, one way people sometimes use a particularly rye cover crop is that they'll grow it in the, they'll plant it in the late summer, early fall, let it grow in the fall and then again in the spring. Um, and then when they're ready to plant their uh, cash crop the second year, they'll roll it down so it just lays on the surface like this. So you've had the benefit of a cover crop over the fall and spring. Your soil's been covered through the winter and spring, so you're missing a lot of those erosion opportunities in spring rainstorms. Uh, your soil stays covered all summer, again, reducing erosion. Um, and then you don't have to weed this thing either. Yeah, so in this case, um, you can definitely do this by hand on a smaller scale. I've done it and it works. Um, in this case, they probably have a special tractor that um, has essentially like a big rolling pin and then a cutting tool on the, so it uh, will kind of slice a row through here and then the planter can go behind that into that opened up row. All right, and we've talked a lot about organic matter. All right, so I asked at the beginning of the class if anybody uh, was familiar with cover crops, and I had a few people raise your hands. What do you know, or how have you used them, or come into contact with them? Have you had friends who've grown them? Just research, um, just broadening my knowledge. Okay. We took virgin grown, um, 20 year fallow, prairie grown, and turned it and we tried to plant cover crop just to get some organic matter into it. And we didn't get buckwheat to grow 18 inches. <laughs> so, you know, it's the beginning of the cycle. Mm -hmm. We have to get something in there to grow, to get more, to grow. Mm -hmm. So, we're starting. Awesome. I love buckwheat as a starting cover crop too. It's really easy to work with and friendly in that way. Yep, that can happen. What cover crop was it? I think it was um, oats. Oats. And, um, uh huh. Yep, that's a pretty typical. Uh, I had. Uh, I there's a three-year cover crop on the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, I we till it down and we farm it. Um, we barely said it's on your beans. Um, we didn't have to deal with Colorado beetles. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was pretty good. It awesome. was a idea. Great. That's a nice range of experience. Is there, like, people, like, ever use it for Colorado? Um, they'll like, it and sell it. Um, yeah, you could. Um, you're not getting the benefit then of putting that organic matter back in, uh, but you are getting the root structure in your soil. So. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, kind of do half and half or, you know, play with it so that you find a system that works on your farm. I, I think that's true on what you said because uh, the guy that we granted his land was eight, his alfalfa was turning to eight. Mm -hmm. so we, didn't probably, we didn't get that much good uh, organic nutrition to the soil. Yeah, yeah. But you're still getting the benefit of good root structure and of not tilling that soil for a while. that we deal with with cover crops. Um, let's, time
timing of planting and termination. So you mentioned that you didn't get to uh, tilling your oats and peas in time and you created a weed crop. That's a definite problem that you need to be aware of going into cover crops. Um, what do you do with the residue? Depending upon what kind of crop you're doing, it might be really hard to deal with with the kind of equipment you have. So it's important to think about ahead of time uh, how, what that crop's gonna look like when it's done growing and how you're gonna deal with it on your specific farm with your specific equipment. Uh, winter hardiness, we need to think about for anything that we're planting in the fall that we're hoping to overwinter. Uh, rye vetch mixes are a really common thing around here that people will plant in the fall and want to come back. So you need to make sure that you're choosing varieties that are hardy. Um, and will they compete with my main crop? So thinking about timing and when you have windows in your rotation that you can plant the cover crop and get the benefit without harming your cash crop. What would be a good cover crop that would, um, if you planted it right in the summer or spring, that it would die with the uh, coming frost in the fall and then you'd have the residue for the spring planting? Yeah. I'm going to get into specific cover crops in a couple minutes, so I'm going to hold that question, but bring okay. it back up if I don't answer. Um, so selecting a cover crop, these are my kind of four go-to things that I ask myself when I'm thinking about cover cropping. So first I want to think about what I'm trying to do with that cover crop. We mentioned a lot of different things. We can control weeds, we can add nitrogen, we can add organic matter, we can reduce erosion. We can uh, provide habitat for pollinators. We can try and reduce harmful pests. So there's a whole list of things we can do with cover crops. We can probably do a couple of those things with the same cover crop, but probably not all of them. So you need to think about what your goals are on your farm. Do you want to add nitrogen? Do you want to add soil organic matter? You might choose a different thing depending upon what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, the second is thinking about your seasonal windows. And this is the term that I like to use um, in thinking about your timing. So uh, he asked about what could I plant that's gonna winter kill. Um, maybe you planted bell peppers and you harvested your crop and you've got 40 days at the end of the summer before you expect frost. 40 days is enough to plant a quick crop of buckwheat. Um, so there's different things that you can plant depending upon how much time, what time of the year it is, um, and what your goals are. We always want to make plans for termination. We want to know that we can get rid of that thing before it's becoming a problem and setting seed on our farm. And start small. Um, cover cropping is, it can be a huge thing. There's a ton to learn, um, a ton to experiment with, but it can be a fun thing that you do a little bit at a time. Nobody says that you have to cover crop your whole farm. Um, if you've got one half a bed just sitting there, throw something in um, and see what happens and you can do it more or different the next time. It doesn't have to be a big commitment. Um, as I'm talking about this, I'm going to pass around some different seeds. Uh, they are all labeled so that you can see what they are and you can just kind of get a sense of what they look like. Alright, so I'm going to talk about two primary categories of cover crops today. There's non-legumes and legumes. So legumes are the category of cover crops that are going to fix nitrogen and add the nitrogen to your soil. The non-legumes are not going to fix nitrogen, but they can give you a lot of other benefits like organic matter, controlling pests, um, suppressing weeds, reducing erosion, and scavenging nutrients. So if we're at that point at the end of the season where we want to pull all the nitrogen back up and save it for the next year, that's when I'm going to want to use a grass. All right, so choosing a goal. I mentioned some of these, uh, but you have them on your handout here. Uh, reducing erosion, pretty much anything that covers the soil is gonna help with this. If you want nitrogen, make sure that you're looking at legumes and you wanna terminate it when the flowers start to appear. A fall catch crop to uh, bring the nutrients back out of the soil is gonna be a grass or a brassica. If you want to add a lot of organic matter, anything with a really good root system, especially grasses, uh, weed suppression, pretty much anything that grows quickly and covers the ground. 
um, and it's going to block out sunlight for other things. And if you have compaction issues, large rooted crops, um, tillage radish is the thing that people love to use the most for that, but there's certainly other things that have a similar um, growth pattern. All right, you all have a handout of this, and I want to spend a couple minutes talking through this. Um, so this is a chart from Territorial Seed Company. Uh, I just pulled it off the internet. There are lots of other similar charts, but um, I thought this was a really nice uh, kind of handy reference. So it lists a lot of the species that we grow in this area. Um, it tells you generally when to plant them, how warm your soil needs to be for them to germinate, uh, how deep you should plant it, how many pounds per hundred square, or thousand square feet or acre, which is really nice depending upon which uh, what scale of farming you're at. Uh, hardiness zone, if you're wanting it to overwinter, that's important. And then it gives you a nice idea of the different purposes that you could use this cover crop for. Uh, the other thing, I brought the wrong book, but um, how many of you are familiar with SARE? Great. Um, I want, I didn't put this in the presentation, but all of you should know about SARE. S-A-R-E um, is a, this is their logo down here in the corner and I'll pass this book around. So they are uh, the Sustainable Agriculture Resource and Education Service. They're a federal program. Uh, they have offices in every state. The Minnesota office is right over here on the St. Paul U of M campus. And they produce really fabulous free materials. Uh, you can go on their website and get all of their stuff for free. You can download this whole book for free. Um, if you want to get a paper copy of it, they're pretty cheap. They just ask you to pay for printing costs, essentially. So I think this book is $20, um, and it's like, a book that I look at every single day. Um, I do also have, let's see, I have four of them, but we could get more. Um, so this flash drive has copies of all of Sarah's books. So maybe I'll give them to Laura, um, and she can distribute them, and if other people want them, we can get some more. Um, really awesome resources. So. The reason I started talking about this, there's another book that looks just like this, and I grabbed the wrong one off my desk, but it's a cover crop book, um, and you can, there's a lot of really good general information about cover crops, um, sort of more in-depth information of the same kind of stuff we're talking about, but it also has a, a big section of it that you can just look up cover crops. So you could look up rye, and it'll tell you how to plant rye, what it's good for, uh, how to manage it, what kind of bugs it gets, um, just like all the nitty gritty details that you might want to know about planting any of those things. The one come on there, second from the right. What's the heading say? It says nematode and syncotan control. So I was talking about those uh, harmful nematodes that can bring disease into your soil. These are uh, things that are gonna control those pests. So you probably don't need to worry about it unless you're specifically dealing with those soil-borne insects. Um, I think that the roots exude chemicals that the insects don't do well living in. And so for like, for example, mustard, does the mustard do the green? Um, the roots also produce uh, the phenolic acids or whatever it is that, you know, have that sort of characteristic mustard smell. Um, yep, yep. So you could grow that as a cover crop and Yeah, you could. All right, so timing is one of the biggest issues that we deal with in cover cropping. Um, because we all want to grow as much productive cash crop as we can in our farm so that we're making the most income. Um, and we have to figure out how to make that trade-off that we're getting the benefits of cover cropping without giving up our income. So there's three major uh, timings that I like to think of. 
Uh, the first is winter kilt covers for an early spring planting. So one thing I can do is uh, say I grew peppers or tomatoes or whatever in a field. Once I take those things out, um, if I have maybe 20 or 30 days before frost, I can plant a cover crop, let it get some growth in the fall, and then um, it's going to die when it freezes. So this is a really good option if you don't have uh, big equipment on your farm because you don't need a tractor. The winter is going to take care of it for you. And then that's really nice because it's, that field is ready to go early in the spring. So that'd be a really good choice if I wanted to plant early spring spinach or lettuce or something like that. Um, the second is overwintered covers. So this is something like rye or vetch that's going to grow a little bit in the fall, but really it's going to put on most of its uh, biomass in the springtime. I'm probably not going to till this in until middle of May, so this is really only a good option if I don't want to plant an early spring crop and maybe I'm going to plant tomatoes or peppers or eggplants, you know, May 20th or June 1st. And then the other thing is a midsummer cover. So uh, buckwheat is the thing that I think of most commonly for that window. I grew early spring arugula. I have you know, a month in the middle of summer where I'm not planning to grow anything. I'll plant some buckwheat, get some growth on that, till it in, and then I'm ready to plant uh, fall spinach or something. Um, it depends. Um, it depends a lot. So like tillage radishes, they freeze and pretty much dissolve. Like there's practically no trace of them in the spring. Um, something like uh, field pea, you're still going to have some plant material. So it depends a little. You might decide that you're fine having that surface residue. Um, you might need to till a little bit just so that you can get good seed to soil contact depending upon what crop you're putting in in the spring. But you're not going to, really you're going to have to do the same amount of tillage as you would if you hadn't planted a cover crop. It's going to be, you know, pretty minimal. So for your cover crop, do you want to use a seeder or a seed like? Yeah. Um, either way, so I do have a seeder. Um, does anybody have an earthway seeder that you use for like lettuce or something? So in my research group, we have, it's called a jang, J-A-N-G, and it's essentially like six earthways that are together. So it's just something we push by hand. If you were doing a lot, that's really awesome and handy, but honestly, I would say at least three quarters of my work, I just broadcast. Um, you know, it really depends what skill you're at. If you were on a bigger farm, then, you know, it starts making sense maybe, like any other equipment. Um, yeah. Yeah. Generally, if you're broadcasting, uh, you're going to want to increase your seed rate a little bit or uh, think about how you can improve that seed to soil contact. So you might want to go over it with a rake or, you know, disturb the soil a little bit just so that they're not sitting on the surface getting eaten by birds. Um, but Broadcasting, that's just throwing it on the top of the soil? Yep. That, yep. That's the first step. Of yep. Um, you do... Most seeds will germinate a little bit better if they have some soil on top of them. Um, not all, some seeds actually need light to germinate. But uh, we also sometimes, we call it a belly grinder. Uh, yeah, like you would use to seed grass and so it like has a neck thing or it straps around and then you twist it and it kind of makes the seed fly out. You can get them for like a few dollars at the hardware store. So, you know, there's some little tools like that that you know, are cheap. I feel like I see at uh, Goodwill all the time the grass seeder things that you crank. So, yeah, but you know, seed in an ice cream bucket that you're flinging around works too. I think one way you can do just if there's a whole case of our rains coming and you do right before the yes. rain coming and then I think uh, they will, they'll soak in the flower and make the content. That's a great point. If you can time it before a rainstorm, that's always better. Um, and then you don't have to irrigate it too because we want cover crops to be as easy as possible, right? So save yourself the effort. Awesome. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more about this timing. So these are just some kind of rough examples. Um, and switch it around however it works on your farm. Um, 
So in the green here, I have a couple examples of different crops that we might grow in Minnesota. And then these are some different cover crops. So we talked a little bit about how, you know, we could just decide, wow, this field really needs more organic matter. I'm gonna rotate this field out of production for a year and I'm gonna just take a whole growing season to, grant, to grow a cover crop. Sometimes we do that if we really wanna remediate our soil. Um, but there's also ways that we can get both a cash crop and a cover crop. So we can seed in that fall, uh, late fall, just get a little bit of green growth of some rye or something, and then give it until maybe May to grow mostly in the spring. Uh, we can also do that fall seeded winter kill we talked about, or we can look at that little window in the middle of the summer. And then here's the same thing with our green cash crops mixed in. So, lots of different choices for how we can do it. Um, and Laura tells me that you are all working on a farm rotation plan too. So, I hope that this is good timing for you to think a little bit about how you might start mixing some of those cover crops in before or after some of the cash crops that you're thinking about growing. One of the things we want to make sure we avoid is having our cover crop compete with our cash crop. So it's a little bit hard to tell here, but this photo is actually in one of our research high tunnels. And what we're doing here, so we have these here with the wooden stakes, our rows of uh, bell peppers. And our question was, you know, these bell peppers, we want to keep in the ground as long as possible so that we're getting as much harvest off of them. Uh, but we also want to grow a cover crop. So we were wondering if we could seed the cover crop in the aisles of our high tunnel. And then once we get to the point of the season that our peppers aren't really producing anymore, can we pull out the peppers and then have the cover crop kind of just fill in in the vegetable rows? And the answer is yeah, we think it works. Uh, we're still kind of looking through some of the numbers, but I'm showing you this slide not to tell you that this is exactly how you should do it, but be creative. Think about, you know, you can mix cover crops in time, but you can also mix them spatially. Um, so you wouldn't want to plant a cover crop when you're NRCS, that organization I was talking about that does the soil education, they have a really great website called Web Soil Survey. If you type in NRCS Web Soil or just soil, you'll come to this website. So if you click start this big green button here, um, it takes you to this screen and you can in this um, Right here, you can do a go down to addresses, and I put in the MFA farm to get here. Um, and then you draw a square around the area you're interested in. Uh, yeah. Web soil, if you just Google web soil survey, you'll get it. Either, either for 
Yeah, so a lot of this, um, so I think you actually have print, printouts of these uh, screenshots at the back of your uh, slide um, to walk you through how to do it. So the one caveat I will give about this is that a lot of the soils data is pretty old, um, which mostly doesn't matter because our soil doesn't change that much. Like your soil type will always be your soil type. But if you're in an urban farm environment, those urban soils do get changed a lot more and you might have infill or something, so that might be different. But if you're on a rural soil, this is gonna give you your soil type. So you're gonna start by going to this address, type in the address you're interested in. You can scroll in or out and then use these red uh, squares to draw an area around your farm. Um, and then after you do that, you're going to go to the soil map tab, and it's going to tell you, it's going to give you these contour lines and tell you all the different soil types in your farm. So if you are, if you currently have land, you can use this to find out what type of soil you have, but this is also really helpful if you're shopping for new farmland. If you're ever looking at a piece of land and deciding if you want to rent it or buy it, you can go online, look up the address, and get information about what soil type is there. It's called um, it's called Web Soil Survey, and I think is it in your packet? Great. Uh, and it's pretty interesting. You can see this is a farm that I used to work on, um, and all these yellow lines are showing you different soil types. So they're all going to be pretty similar in most cases, but it's pretty interesting. You can see you know kind of the effects of glaciation or whatever that you. Uh, kind of got this neat mix that follows the topography.